Good morning, everybody. This is Dylan Greenwood. And this is Harold Eustache. Here at Greenwood Law. Uh, for the record with Greenwood Law, and today with us we got a very special guest, and that is Bob Crumley. Thank you. Uh, a pleasure to have you here. And the reason why we have Mr. Crumley with us is because he is the founder of Founders Hemp. And we're here today to talk about all of the legal issues and relationship that is uh, at a big issue and it's a boiling point here in North Carolina surrounding marijuana, hemp, and CBD. And I think a lot of people would be surprised, uh, Harold, to find out that back um, about a couple of years ago at this point, mm -hmm. the SBI, State Bureau of Investigation here in North Carolina, actually came out with a directive that was sent to all law enforcement, sent to every DA's office here in North Carolina, saying that they could not differentiate between legal hemp and illegal marijuana. It was, and it was a big deal, and it caused quite a, um, a bit of stir, uh, both in the legislature and among the legal community, because there are so many cases that we see that are based on uh, the smell of marijuana. So a lot of times law enforcement will find probable cause to search uh, an individual or vehicle or a residence because of the smell of marijuana or the sight of marijuana itself and, and it's um, this uh, memo determined that it's hard, you can't determine you can't there's no difference between marijuana and hemp in both its smell and the way that it looks correct and you were actually instrumental in getting the hemp law passed yes. here in North Carolina yeah um, me and another lawyer from uh, Greensboro uh, by the name of Marshall Hurley. He and I co-wrote the statute. Uh, we negotiated the terms of the statute with the Department of Agriculture. Um, I also founded the North Carolina Industrial Hemp Association and we were very instrumental in lobbying to get the bill passed and then subsequent to that um, Marshall and I uh, wrote, we've probably had a hand in or wrote probably 60, 70 percent of the regulations affecting hemp in North Carolina. So uh, neck deep in hemp. Yes. So, so what is the difference between hemp and marijuana? Uh, well, it's an artificial difference in a lot of ways. Um, hemp is defined as cannabis uh, sativa having less than 0.3, th three tenths of one percent of THC. THC, of course, being the the chemical that gets you high, the psychotropic mm -hmm. chemical in cannabis. Uh, that 3.3 3 number is a made-up number. It has no relevance to any kind of uh, medical fact, any kind of scientific fact. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute made up number. Experts agree that it takes two to 3% THC in cannabis to have any psychotrophic effect at all. But I'm here to tell you, if you sold two or 3% marijuana on the streets of Winston-Salem, somebody's probably gonna kill you. The, <laughs> the marijuana that's on the streets now is 25 to 30% THC. So the 0.3 was a made up number it was mm -hmm. passed by the federal Congress, um, and it, it, it just it, it totally is made up. It has no relevance to, to the psychotrophic nature or not the non-psychotrophic -psycho nature of uh, cannabis. So basically, it's, it's created this delineation that if it's below the 0.3%, right. then all of a sudden, that's got to be hemp, that's fine, that's legal. That's correct. If it's above the 0.3%, it's looked at as illicit. It, as marijuana. Yes, yes. Under, the, under the Controlled Substances Act, Federal Controlled Substances Act, anything that is not qualified as hemp uh, is uh, in fact marijuana. Um, and um, you know, interesting that you were talking about a minute ago about the SBI directive. The, the, the back story behind that is the reason that the SBI can't differentiate is because they use a, a process that changes the molecular structure of the product, of the, of the green leafy vegetable material mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. they're testing it. Uh, they use a process called gas chromatography. Which heats it up. Heats it up. In order to get a gas, you have mm -hmm. to heat something up to get a gas. If you heat water, you get a gas called steam. Mm -hmm. If you heat up cannabis, you get a gas. And their process then changes what's in the, in the marijuana called THCA, converts it into delta-9 THC. They don't have the equipment. They don't have the HPLC, the, the, the liquid chromatography processes to make a distinction in the very minute levels of what the THC is. So what and, you're getting at is that the state crime lab through the SBI, they can detect the presence of THC that's correct. of some level of that's THC, correct. 
but they can't figure out the actual level of THC. That's correct, because they've never had to care about it before. Mm -hmm. See, under the Controlled Substances Act in North Carolina, the Controlled Substances Act federally, all it made a difference was, is there Delta-9 THC present? There was no level of Delta-9 required. The 2014 Farm Bill, which brought hemp and, and carved out an exception to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Controlled Substances Act, that created the point three. Now it created for law enforcement the requirement that they have to make a distinction between what is the THC level product in there. Well, that's just the thing. It's the testing. The yeah. testing's the issue. Mm -hmm. But other than that, can you tell a difference here? I don't think there's a way to tell the difference based on sight or, or smell. There really is not, which creates another problem for law enforcement. Um, for the last 30, 50 years, law enforcement has been using the sight and smell of cannabis as probable cause to search a vehicle. They no longer have that ability to do that because if I've got, if I've got evidence associated with my cannabis that it in, is in fact hemp uh, and not marijuana, where is the probable cause to search the car if they find green leafy vegetable material that happens to be marked as, as hemp? Now, interestingly enough, I was involved with the, uh, uh, the Guilford County Sheriff's Department. They were testing a roadside testing kit that would make, tell the difference between hemp and marijuana. Uh, they tested it internally at the Guilford County Sheriff's Department and found it to be 100 percent accurate. Mm -hmm. The problem is they didn't have the fifty to hundred thousand dollars that it would take in order to replicate that study by an independent lab. Mm -hmm. And so North Carolina law enforcement would not use that test even though it's being used in multiple company countries in Europe, it's being used in Virginia, it's being used in Washington State. So the, the as well the, the federal guys, the, the DEA and uh, the I think perhaps even the USDA have been working with some testing agencies to develop a roadside testing kit. Mm -hmm. But my position has been uh, that law enforcement really doesn't want a roadside testing kit. And why is that, Bob? Because they lose their probable cause. They want to search that vehicle. They will tell you, they told legislators straight up that they get a lot of, of, of additional drug seizures, they get money seizures, they get vehicle seizures from being able to search that vehicle and hope, hoping that they find either other illegal drugs, guns, money, whatever the case may be. And that makes sense because sometimes we see cases in which a person isn't even charged with possession of marijuana, um, but the search is pursuant to marijuana. So yes. mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'll read a report and the search was about marijuana, but subsequently there's or, no charge. Yes. Or our client's talking to us and they're saying, th this is the, the classic scenario. Driving along, they get pulled over, let's say they ran a red light, mm -hmm. stop sign. Mm -hmm. Cop pulls up and says, I smell something. I smell mm -hmm. marijuana. I need to search. And a lot of people think, well, I got, I got to let them search. Right. right. Because they're, they're telling me that they have to search because they, right. they're saying they smell marijuana. And that's what we see. Even after this SBI directive came out, yes. we still get these cases. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and where they're trying to, to use smell as a way to justify. And Harold, you're exactly right. I don't know how many cases we've had where the smell or the mm -hmm. site of it was used to initiate a search. And then what was found was uh, arguably what the police officer would rather find, whether it be an illegal firearm, mm -hmm. more drugs, mm -hmm. you know, something that mm -hmm. you know, wouldn't necessarily have been detected before. And then that's the jackpot. But the issue with hemp and with marijuana is, is that you can't tell the difference between a legal activity legal by the laws of the federal government and by the state of North Carolina between an illegal activity uh, by the laws of the federal government and the state of North Carolina, there's, there's no way to tell the difference. So because there's no way to tell the difference, uh, then it, there's no way to determine that an actual criminal activity may have been afoot to determine that probable cause. And that's what the SBI directive gets at. Right. And they even go so far as to even talk about the issue, how it pertains to canine detection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can, can dogs the, tell yeah, the difference? There was one law enforcement agency in Indiana or Illinois that came out and said, oh, because of this, we're going to have to put down all of our canines because th they're no longer of any value to us. I mean, how mm -hmm. silly is that? I mean, look, the, the bottom line is this. Law enforcement has had since 2014 
to get on track with this. Guys, that's six years. This has been a legal product in the United States for six years. I call it lazy law enforcement. I've educated law enforcement all over North Carolina, including right here in Forsyth County. I've educated on, on cannabis, hemp, the Forsyth County Police, De uh, the Forsyth County Sheriff's Department, mm -hmm. the Winston-Salem Police Department, and the Winston-Salem State University. Uh, they brought their police department over as well, all the way up to assistant chiefs. And, and I talked to them two years ago on these issues that you have got to get cracking if, if you want to and get on the bandwagon of doing roadside testing. The bottom line is, guys, they don't want to do roadside testing. If they do roadside testing, they lose their probable cause in a good percentage of the cases. So what do they want to do? They want to ban smokable hemp. The problem with banning what they refer to as smokable hemp is every part of the hemp plant can be smoked. Well, that's what they've tried to do recently in the legislation. Yes, they tried to do it in North Carolina. And the, because the new farm bill uh, that was proposed, I believe in 2019, yes. Uh, was still pending. Yeah. It finally got signed by, it was ratified and then approved by the governor this past summer. Mm -hmm. And in that bill, there was some very strong language that attacked hemp and smokable hemp and anyone who right. sells it. There was, and we were able to fight that back and, and beat that back. And I'll also, um, uh, I was on record, I got interviewed several times about it, and I said, I don't care what the legislature passes in an attempt to ban smokable hemp. We'll be in federal court so fast that they they won't even the ink won't be dry on the governor's signature if it included a ban on smokable hemp because it's unenforceable. When a farmer grows hemp for a legal purpose to sell to a company like mine to extract legal legal CBD from that plant, it's dried. He dries it. It is now smokable. Mm -hmm. If he lets a plant grow in his field and just die in his field and it dries up. It's now smokable. You can smoke the roots. You can smoke the stalk. Not going to do anything for you, but if you wanted to smoke them, you could. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it creates an environment that is totally unenforceable. And that's why both cases that we're aware of, the courts have said, no, we're not going to enforce this uh, ban on smokable hemp. Bob, was there, was there any lobbying in order to push those amendments to ban smokable oh, hemp? Oh, absolutely. The law enforcement community was fighting it. And they weren't even being shy about it. One person from the SBI actually said to the legislators, this is about probable cause. If we, if we have the testing by the roadside, we lose our probable cause. So we want smokable hemp banned, so therefore any dried, marrow, any dried cannabis mm -hmm. in a car, we get to assume is for smokable purposes, and we're going to use it for probable cause. I mean, the intellectual jumps that law enforcement is, is putting upon itself to, to keep doing these searches of people's cars, right. it's, it's phenomenal. So have you, do you know of any cases where someone had a legal substance of hemp and it was construed as, as an illegal substance? Oh, and, absolutely. And for that they it's got- It's happened right here in Forsyth County. Uh, we had a case uh, that we, we worked with in Kernersville and a Kernersville Police Department a person who had a, a, um, a DEA business card with them and an ALE agent came into a convenience store. This convenience store had legal hemp products on the shelf. They flashed their badges, handed the, the card that said DEA on it, and <clears throat> proceeded to say they were going to search the premises, and they seized his hemp, all of his legal bottled hemp. What they seized actually said on it that it was legal hemp processed under the 2014 federal farm bill. So now here, they did not have a search warrant, right? They were mm -hmm. in basically under an ALE mm -hmm. uh, because they were selling beer, they could come mm -hmm. in and look. And then they illegally seized this product. And we got involved, and the reason we got involved because the product seized was made by our company. Mm -hmm. We don't make marijuana products, we only make hemp products. It created a real problem for law enforcement because of Congress in the Budget Act had said that the DEA could spend no money in any way interfering with the production of hemp. So here you had a DEA business card being given by a person who had the DEA by their name to somebody seizing illegally hemp. We called them on that and they very quickly, the DEA said, oh no, 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 that's not our person. Mm -hmm. uh, that person was a member of a DEA task force. They actually worked for another law enforcement. They don't work for, I mean, they started crawdadding so fast. We then called ALE. 
ALE said, well, this was not our situation. We didn't seize that stuff. Or we were just there along for the ride. This was all Kernersville. And after a period of several months, we finally got the, our, our, our customer finally got their product back, mm -hmm. but no, no apology, no correction of the process, no damages. It's also happened in Stokes County. It's happened in Surrey County. It's happened in a lot of counties around here where law enforcement officers ignore the law and just decide we're against anything cannabis and we're going to go in and do what we want to do. If you're just joining us on WTOB, I'm Harold Eustache and also Attorney Dylan Greenwood is here with Greenwood Law for the record. Um, we're discussing hemp and CBD um, issues uh, versus marijuana with Mr. Crumley. Um, one of the questions that we had was there's a stigma out there about um, marijuana mm -hmm. and hemp and a lot mm -hmm. of people just conflate them together and kind right. of feel like they're the same thing. Sure. Can you explain some of the history on hemp and, sure. and, and why it's important to right. understand the difference? Well, cannabis has been used, non-psychotrophic cannabis has been used for thousands of years. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I speak to religious groups, and I've spoken to many, I mentioned to them that uh, cannabis is, is talked about in the Bible. Mm -hmm. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 32, it is actually one of the oils, the oil from the cannabis plant is one of the oils that was used to anoint new priests. Mm -hmm. So it's been around a long time. It was used to make uh, canvas. It was, uh, that's where the word cannabis, uh, the word canvas comes from the word cannabis. It was used to make clothing. It's, it's been around for a long time. The, the paper blue, for the Declaration of Independence, paper right? Paper for the Declaration of Independence. The, the uh, first blue jeans in North Carolina were made with a, with a, ca a cannabis a hemp blend of hemp and cotton. Why? Because it's one of the most the strongest fibers known to man. What happened was with cannabis was folks started farming cannabis in at higher altitudes, hotter climates, and then when they ingested it, they got this, ooh, oh, okay. Now you've always, and with regular hemp, you can get a relaxation from that. You can get a, a reduction of anxiety from, from hemp cannabis. What you don't get from hemp cannabis is the high. You don't get stoned. You don't sit around and eat Cheetos all afternoon, right? <laughs> and so, and so, you know, and and, but but it's good for a lot of things, and a lot of a lot of folks are using it. And so we knew when we were going in that part of the, what we had to do as an industry was to break this stigma. We had to separate ourselves very clearly from the the marijuana world, and and stick with the hemp world, and let folks know this is a non psychotrophic. I've I've, I've told folks the the um, very first day we opened uh, with Founders Hemp, we opened a retail store. The very first day we opened a retail store, in walks a guy and his, his wife. I didn't know at the time they were husband and wife, I found out later. Um, we'd been open about two hours. They stroll in, they see me, they walk straight to me. There'd been a lot of newspaper articles about me doing this. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, well, this might be interesting. And he walks up to me and he says, I'm a Baptist minister. And I thought, okay, this could go either way. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, he said, I want to tell you something that I told my church on Sunday, okay? And he said, I told him there's three things I want you to do this week. And he said, Mr. Crumley, the first two are really spiritual and we don't need to go into those today. But the third thing I told them was that they need to come visit the hemp store. And I said, really, tell me why. And he said, I have one of my folks in my church and they have bad cancer. And he said, now Mr. Crumley, he said, they started using the hemp that, that you have. And he says, you haven't cured their cancer. And I said, no, sir. Hemp is not going to cure cancer. At least we don't think so right now. I will tell you though, there's a couple of promising studies that mm -hmm. are having some good things, but right now it's not there. Mm -hmm. And I said, no sir, it, do it doesn't do that. He said, but you know what it does? It's reduced his pain. It allows him to sleep at night and it's re reduced his anxiety. And so I've told my people, they need to come here and they need to see what this is about. I've got city councilmen taking our products. I've got an undercover vice narcotics officer, grab that one for a second, an undercover vice narcotics officer for a sheriff's department in this region uses our product, children in schools using our product, um, doctors prescribing in essence, you don't need a prescription for this product, mm -hmm. but telling their patients to get it. So a lot of that stigma has been broken over the last several years. But we still have people occasionally to come to our store and they'll take a hold of the handle and they'll look both ways and then they'll open the door like, am I doing something wrong? Am I doing mm -hmm. something? Wrong? And so it's going to take some time to break that stigma, but, uh, but it's being broken. If you're just joining us here on For the Record with Greenwood Law, 
It's Dylan Greenwood, got Harold Eustache here, and Bob Crumley mm -hmm. talking about the relationship between uh, marijuana, hemp, and CBD, and some of the legal issues that it's created here in our state uh, because it, it looks the same, it smells the same, uh, can't tell the difference, and because you can't tell the difference, it's creating a lot of issues with law enforcement. So many issues, in fact, that it has led to the SBI actually uh, sending out a directive uh, saying that because we can't tell the difference, we don't have the ability within the state crime lab to discern the difference between a legal product and an illegal product, then they're making the recommendations that uh, probable cause, which leads to searches and potential arrests, cannot be supported by the look and smell of whatever a uh, police officer is seeing at that moment in time that they're suspecting may be marijuana because it could have just as easily be a legal substance, which is hemp. So Harold, Bob, mm -hmm. somebody's out there on the road. They've got some green leafy material right. and they get pulled over. Practically, how's that gonna go down? Because a lot of times we see people get searched anyway, right? Mm -hmm. They do. And a lot of times people do get searched based on the smell, as we kind of talked about earlier. Um, and Bob, if somebody is searched based on the smell, what are some of the things that you've seen? What are some recommendations you might have that you've well, seen in your career? Yeah, the, the first thing I tell folks when I, when I train them or, or, or lecture about hemp is obey commands. Mm -hmm. if, if, a, if you're a shop owner, and somebody comes in with a badge and says, I don't have a warrant, but I'm taking everything off your shelves. For God's sakes, don't pull a gun on the law. <laughs> don't right, don't, right, don't yeah. fight them. Don't resist. Allow them to do it. We'll deal with the legal issues later. What we right. don't need to deal with is somebody getting hurt or somebody getting in, in, in trouble when they really weren't in trouble to begin with. Right. So what we recommend to our folks is don't smoke hemp in your car driving down the road, number one. You know, this is a product that is medicinal in value. It provides stress release. It provides anxiety relief. It provides pain relief. And so just don't smoke it in your car. Don't create a problem. But if you're going to, do, to smoke it in your car or you have smoked it earlier and now you've got the smell on your clothing um, and the law enforcement officer uh, does not believe you or doesn't want to believe you that you've got your hemp packaging that is hemp, comply with what the officer says. Mm -hmm. Don't create more problems for yourself than what the officer may think that they're going to create uh, for you. If it was an illegal search and seizure that found something illegal, okay, we can deal with that as lawyers. Mm -hmm. If it was an illegal search that didn't find anything, you know, you've, you've lost some time, you've perhaps been embarrassed on the roadside, but let's just don't create a bigger problem for ourselves uh, um, by doing it. The other thing we say to folks is, is keep it in its original container. Um, you know, folks like us and Founders Hemp, you know, we label our material as hemp. And we put on there that it was, it was processed in compliance with the 2014 or 2019 federal farm bills. And so keep it in that container. We actually had a case uh, in Eastern North Carolina where an officer pulled over an individual and they said that they had hemp and they they uh, came out with a package. They were mimicking our package. I had trained mm. that law enforcement uh, sheriff's department in Eastern North Carolina. They'd seen our packaging, mm -hmm. and he said when he saw that packaging, he realized that it was a, a fake. It was, it was, they had copied our, um, our labeling, mm -hmm. but they'd misspelled the city that we're in, Ashborough. They'd mm -hmm. misspelled Ashborough. They'd misspelled a couple of other words in making the fake label. And so he was able to discern, based on us having educated him as a law enforcement mm -hmm. officer, this is not a Founders Hemp product. This is a fake product. He, in fact, seized the product. It was, in fact, marijuana that these folks had done uh, and put in there. So while I'm not always happy with law enforcement in their slowness to pick up roadside testing kits, while I'm not happy with their desire sometimes to use it as a probable cause when there really is no probable cause, mm -hmm. On the flip side, they also can help us when we have educated them and work with them to, to train them about what it is. So it's a training issue. Right. It's a training issue for the, for the public. It's a training issue for folks dealing with the stigma. It's a training issue for law enforcement. 
Well, I think you're exactly right. You know, I don't know how many times, you know, it might actually be a legitimate Fourth Amendment issue mm -hmm. that we do something called a motion to suppress where we suppress that evidence. And you, know, you go to a district attorney or you talk to the law enforcement uh, officer that was involved, you mention the issues, you know, maybe in retrospect they're going, oh, there might have been an issue, but then they bring up, but you know what, that guy was just a complete jerk. Mm -hmm. You know, they acted, you know, such mm -hmm. and such way. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier yes. to get somebody to come around to what you're putting out there mm -hmm. if you can say, well, you know what, this guy was cooperative, he was respectful. Yes, he was asserting uh, his constitutional rights, right. but there's nothing wrong with that. Exactly. So. You can assert your constitutional rights in a respectful way. Absolutely. Right. And, and it's when people disrespect law enforcement or makes law enforcement feel threatened that, that things can sometimes go south. Um, you know, we've actually had shop owners call us with law enforcement in the building, mm -hmm. taking their product, seizing legal product illegally, and, and I have told them, let them take what they want to take. We will deal with these issues later. We're not going to, you know, create a problem for you, you know, on site. Right. Bob, thank you so much for joining us this uh, weekend here on WTOB, talking about hemp and all the legal issues surrounding sure. it. Uh, you've done a lot of great work out there for mm -hmm. uh, a legal product that has a lot of great benefits. So thank you so much sure. for all your work. Happy to be here. Thanks for asking me. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. And don't forget to join us uh, next Sunday here on WTOB, 1030 a.m. for For the Record with Greenwood Law. Uh, election season is in full swing, and North Carolina's Senate race is a key one uh, to see if uh, Democrats can gain control of the Senate. Candidate Cal Cunningham has put his bid in jeopardy given uh, the recent stuff that's come about uh, with a scandal involving some text messages and maybe more. Uh, so Cal might win a Senate seat, but he might also land himself in court. Maybe so, and, and North Carolina's alienation of affection laws could prove uh, very troublesome in the future for Cal. So next week we'll discuss the ins and outs of these sorts of lawsuits and how they might apply to Cal Cunningham. But before we go, uh, do not forget the Greenwood Law Bill of Rights, and we've touched on a lot of it here today, but first, first and foremost, I will not represent myself in court. Second, I will not do law enforcement's job for them. Three, I will not make statements when stopped by law enforcement. Four, I will not consent to searches by law enforcement. And five, I will not be my own star witness for the prosecution. Remember everyone, it's not a crime to know your rights. Stay safe out there, stay informed. This is For the Record with Greenwood Law signing off.